Hello, and welcome to The Thermal Wind Relationship by Dr. John Trage, copyright 2005. The Thermal Wind Relationship is one of the most important concepts in ATS-113, so make sure you get a handle on at least the basics of this concept. Obviously, the A students will really understand everything that's going on and be able to describe things and generalize things, but you really need to be able to understand the Thermal Wind Relationship to understand some of the later concepts in the course. Before we can actually talk about the thermal wind relationship, we have to do a little thought experiment. Suppose you started with a little column of air, and this is going to be a pretty tall thing of air. Suppose that the, uh, the bottom of this column of air was near the surface. So let's give it a pressure of maybe a thousand millibars. But let's say the base of the, the top of the column is quite high. Let's say that this top of the column is 500 millibars. So this column is pretty tall. This might be oh, five, six thousand meters thick. This, the thickness of this column is a meteorological term. We, we describe the thickness as being the distance then between the 500 and 1,000 millibar surface. You could have the thickness between any two levels, between 1,000 and 700 millibars, or 1,000 and 300 millibars, or something like that. But right now we're just working with the idea of 1,000 versus 500. What would happen to that box, that column of air, if we were to heat it? If we were to heat it, the box would expand. Now, assuming that the bottom of the box is somewhere near the surface, it really doesn't have anywhere to go. So the top of the box will rise as the whole column of air expands. This means that the 500 millibar surface is now farther from the ground. The thickness, to use the meteorological term, of the column has increased. Conversely, if we were to cool the box, the box would shrink. Again, if we assume that the base of the box is you know, pretty much stuck down there at the ground, the top of the box, the 500 millibar surface, will have to get pulled down towards the ground. The thickness of the box has decreased, and 500 millibars is now close to the ground. As it happens, only temperature is able to control the thickness of a layer. That's an important truism for later atmospheric science courses only temperature controls the thickness of any layer of the atmosphere. And that fact that the temperature, the, I'm sorry, the pressure surfaces like 500 millibars got higher above the ground when it was warmer below and got closer to the ground when it was colder below is an important generalization. In general, all pressure surfaces are higher above the ground when it is warmer. And that's what this figure from the website and from an older textbook is trying to show you. If you look at say the 700 millibar surface, you can see that above the ground in the tropics it's quite high. However, if you get to the uh, to near the poles where it's very cold, you'll see that the 700 millibar surface gets to be quite low to the ground. In other words, the thickness between the surface and 700 millibars has decreased as you got closer to the pole. The layers near the, near the poles are much less thick, the layers near the tropics are much more thick. This concept then relating temperature to the thickness of a layer and alternatively then to the height of a pressure level is an important concept when you start thinking about what's going on along a polar front where cold air and warm air are meeting. By the way, just an important hint for this course, make sure you know what a polar front is for the next test. All right, we're gonna draw ourselves a little cross section of the atmosphere here. To the, nor the, to the left side of the screen is gonna be to the north and to the right side of the screen is gonna be to the south. So it's cold on the left side and warm on the right screen. Um, we're gonna have cold air coming from the north along the surface. This is some cold air mass. And from the south, we're gonna have some warm air mass meeting it, coming off of the subtropical. And of course, they meet at what we would call a polar front. Is this a cold front? Is this a warm front? Is this a stationary front? Who knows? It doesn't make any difference. It's some sort of polar front. Now let's relate what we just learned about thickness to what's going on along the polar front. Because on the warm side thicknesses are greater, heights like 500 millibars or 400 millibars are going to be very high above the ground. Conversely, on the cold side of the front, heights like 500 millibars and 400 millibars are going to be very close to the ground because the air below them is cold. The thicknesses are low. What's going to happen? right there along the polar front itself. There's going to have to be a very abrupt change in the thickness of the, of the atmosphere. Those height surfaces are going to have to jump very quickly from being very low to the ground on the cold side to being very high above the ground on the warm side. Okay, 
but that has important implications for the pressure gradient force up above the front. I'm going to just draw an imaginary line from the cold side to the warm side of the polar front. We'll label the two endpoints at that point A and B, or that line A and B. What's the pressure at point A? Well, it's hard to know for sure, but I can tell you one thing. It's definitely less than 400 millibars, right? It's up higher than the 400 millibar surface, so let's just take it and say 300 millibars. How about the pressure on the warm side of the front at point B? Well, again, I don't really know, but I can definitely tell it's more than 500 millibars because we are below the 500 millibar surface. So I'll take a stab and say 600 millibars. These are just estimates. But what's going on between point A and point B? There is a huge pressure gradient force between point A and point B. The difference in the pressure between those two points is 300 millibars over a relatively small area. That's a huge pressure gradient force meaning that there is enormous pressure gradient force aloft pushing northward. Let's take a stop here for a moment and rewind. What did we see here? Along the polar front, then aloft, we're going to have a big strong pressure gradient force pushing northward. This pressure gradient force happens aloft. This is not something that's happening at the surface, which is interesting because the front itself is at the surface. And where did it happen? It happened directly above the polar front. It's also pushing towards the north in the northern hemisphere. That doesn't mean the air is going to move to the north. It means there's a force pushing to the north. All right, so now let's think about what this ha means for the mid-latitude jet stream. Suppose then here we have the polar front at the surface. I just drew it here as a purple line. No front is drawn as a purple line, but it gives you an idea. OK, this might be a cold front. This might be a warm front, whatever, as we look at it from above. And we now know that everywhere along this front, aloft, we're going to have a strong pressure gradient force pushing northward. So everywhere along this front, the front's at the surface, but aloft above it, there's going to be a pressure gradient force pushing to the north. Now this is aloft, we're talking, you know, 400 millibars, 300 millibars, something like 7,000 meters above the Earth's surface. These winds are way in geostrophic balance. There's no friction up here. So if we have a strong pressure gradient force pushing to the north, we're going to have to have a west wind, a wind from the west. That way, there's a strong Coriolis force to the south. Remember, the Coriolis force will be to the right of the true wind. If we want to have geostrophic balance, that pressure gradient force to the north is going to have to be balanced by a Coriolis force to the south. And the only way you're going to get a Coriolis force to the south is to have a wind from the west. Where is that wind? Directly above the polar front. So where do we find the, polar, the, the jet stream? Directly above the polar front because of the thermal wind relationship. Let me just try again. Sometimes people are more visual and they want to see it from a different angle to make the... So here I've just sort of skewed that same map off to one side. So we're kind of looking at it in a little perspective. Now we can see that there is that front at the surface, some kind of polar front, and that is where cold air from the north is meeting warm air from the south. Directly above the polar front, then, we're going to have strong westerly winds, the mid-latitude jet stream, due to the strong pressure gradient forces caused by the thermal wind relationship. So to summarize the thermal wind relationship, the mid-latitude jet stream is going to be found directly above a polar front, doesn't matter if it's a cold front, a warm front, or a stationary front. And the cold air is going to be to the left of the flow. That means, in general, the flow will be from the west. Why does this happen? This happens because of changes in thickness associated with the polar front. On one side of the front, the thicknesses are very great. On the other side of the front, the thicknesses are very small. This process is known as the thermal wind relationship. It's actually the thermal wind equation, but you've got to take ATS uh, 572 to learn all about that. All right, I hope I've cleared up some questions you had about the thermal wind relationship. If not, let me know, email, audio blog, office hours, whatever works for you. This has been Dr. John Shroggy, copyright 2005.